For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The reason why I think that's an appropriate place to begin is because throughout history, tyrants have made the offer of what we might call a devil's bargain to those they would tyrannize. In exchange for rights, for liberty, subjects are told they can enjoy peace and safety. One of the most important rights that free men have to defend is the right to bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their rights, their property, their liberty. We're being offered that devil's bargain today, as people say that in exchange for surrendering our God-given right to keep and bear arms, we can enjoy peace and safety guaranteed by an all-powerful state. That's a bad deal any way you look at it. I think one of the best expositions of the point of view that we could call the peace and safety argument is offered by Harold S. Hurd, who is a retired justice of the Kansas Supreme Court, and he is distinguished jurist in residence at the Washburn University School of Law. In a 1997 Law Journal article, Judge Hurd had the following things to say regarding those of us who cling to the increasingly unfashionable view that free men and women have to have the right to keep and bear arms in their own defense. I quote now from Judge Hurd's Law Review article, quote, it is time for America to act responsibly and stop the proliferation of arms. The more guns in private hands, the more fear exists with an increasing demand for more guns. The irrefutable facts are that gun-related violence is running rampant in this country. That is sufficient impetus to attempt to control guns in any way needed to halt the carnage. The statistics of firearms violence in America are overwhelming and the government clearly has the power and authority to do something. Firearms, particularly handguns, are dangerous instrumentalities which government has a duty to regulate for the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public. It is time for the debate to end. It is now time for government to discharge its duty and furnish public security." Close quote. Now, how does Judge Hurd treat those of us who might disagree with that worldview? Well, according to him, we are, quote, extremists who refuse to accept majority rule even on social and economic issues where it clearly applies, and who are united by the belief that the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees an individual right to bear arms. This right to bear arms is essential to extremists because they feel that the only way to protect their rights is by arming themselves. They never mention the rule of law except to assert it in their efforts to oppose gun control. They are convinced killing solves problems." Close quote. Now, Judge Hurd's perspective, which I'm powerfully tempted to refer to as herd poisoning in recognition of Orwell's term for status propaganda, is fact-starved and falsehood obese. It's also quite typical of what passes for scholarship in legal circles these days regarding the right to keep and bear arms. It also has some interesting historical resonances and parallels, both in ancient history and in more contemporary history. I think that a 1777 proposal that was written by William Knox, who was the Under Secretary of State for the British Colonial Office. That proposal was entitled, What is Fit to be Done with America? I think that's sort of a first draft for the worldview that Judge Hurd represents. Uh, here is an excerpt, a brief excerpt from the 1777 proposal from Secretary Knox, and I think that it is quite an interesting parallel to Judge Hurd's comments. Quote, the militia law should be repealed and not suffered to be reenacted, and the arms of the people should be taken away, and every piece of ordinance removed into the king's stores. The subjects will have but little need of such things for the future, as the king's troops, ships, and forts will be sufficient to protect them from any danger." Close quote. That is, any danger except that which is represented, individual freedom, by the king's army. It will be recalled that our war for independence began on April 19th of 1775 when militiamen in Lexington, Massachusetts refused to surrender their arms to the British redcoats, or if you will, to the peacekeepers of the time. Three days later, after the opening skirmish of our war for independence, uh, British General Thomas Gage ordered civic officials in Boston to conduct what is now commonly called a gun turn-in program. A uh, more contemporary expression for this is micro-disarmament. That's the expression that the United Nations likes to use, and we'll refer to that a little bit later. Armed men in Boston, patriots, were invited to surrender their weapons to civic authorities in, into the temporary custody of civic, civic authorities they were promised in exchange for amnesty, and more than 3,000 weapons were turned in pursuant to this offer. 
After the weapons were turned in, General Gage and his men informed those who would surrender their arms that the weapons surrender was now to be continued indefinitely. In other words, he went back on his word. And on July 6th of that year, July 6th of 1775, the Continental Congress adopted a document written by Thomas Jefferson and John Dickinson entitled The Declaration of Causes on take, of Taking Up Arms. And in that list of grievances, General Gage's disarmament of the Bostonian Patriots through deception was very prominently mentioned as one of the reasons why America had no choice but to withdraw from the British Empire. So we can see that in the worldview of the extremists who presided over our war for independence and later on went, to, went on to create our Constitution, in their worldview, it was understood that free men cannot be debarred the use of weapons in defense of their liberties. A population of free armed people can be governed, but it is difficult to rule. For those who would be free, the right of armed self-defense is indispensable. For those who would rule, it is a nearly insurmountable obstacle to their ambitions. And I think that that's a necessary understanding as we continue our review of what's going on with respect to civilian disarmament, both nationally and internationally. Now, from time to time, a shaft of candor will penetrate the murk of misinformation that conceals the true intentions of our would-be rulers. There's a fellow by the name of Gregory King who was a spokesman for the Justice Department under Bill Clinton and Janet Reno, and he was caught in a moment of candor of that sort in 1998 as he tried to explain why the much-vaunted Brady Law resulted in a negligible number of criminal prosecutions. In 1999, for instance, only 29 people were convicted of lying about criminal records as they went about trying to purchase a firearm. Now, speaking on behalf of the Clinton regime, Gregory King had the following explanation. He explained that the purpose of the Brady Law was, quote, to keep people from getting guns, not to increase federal prosecutions, close quote. Now, the Brady Law has been deemed an indispensable public safety measure that should have a dampening effect on murder and suicide. The American Medical Association, however, in a study released in early of August of the year 2000, disclosed that the Brady Act had no measurable impact on murder and suicide rates, and a modest reduction was visible as a result of the Brady Act on the number of uh, people 55 and older who had used handguns as a suicide method of choice. That is not to say, however, that the Brady Act has had no measurable impact on the subject of crime. Uh, to borrow from the language of the medical pr uh, profession, if crime is to be considered a disease, then the Brady Law, and other types of civilian disarmament measures could be considered an iatrogenic treatment, that is to say, a treatment that makes the affliction even worse. There is a scholar by the name of John Lott of Yale University, the Yale University Law School, who is the nation's foremost authority on the relationship between firearms and violent crime. And according to Professor Lott, one direct effect of the Brady Law has been to leave women particularly vulnerable to rape and other forms of violent assault. And Professor Lott has documented a correlation between the enactment of the Brady Law and a 3.6 percent increase in rapes and a 3 percent increase in aggravated assault against women. In brief, the Brady Law has been a staggering failure as both a crime control measure and as a public safety measure. But once again, as the Clinton administration admitted through Gregory King, uh, neither crime reduction nor public safety was the objective of the Brady Law. Civilian disarmament was the objective of that measure. I think it would be worthwhile at this point to review briefly some of the history and some of the philosophy that undergird the American understanding of the right to keep and bear arms. The right to own weapons and to use them, peacefully if possible, violently if it is tragically necessary to do so, in defense of one's person, property, and liberty, does not depend upon the Second Amendment to the Constitution. And the abolition of the Second Amendment, however unwise that would be, would not give the central government the authority to take our guns away, because that power was not delegated to the central government. The right to keep and bear arms, like the other rights mentioned and protected in the Bill of Rights, is a natural or God-given right. And it is a fundamental right which distinguishes freemen from feudal serfs and citizens from slaves. It is, in fact, a duty of those who would be free to defend and exercise that right. 
By acknowledging the right of the people to keep and bear arms, the framers of the Bill of Rights explicitly recognized a critical fact about the nature of our constitutional republic. Our government, almost uniquely in history, does not assume that the state has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force and that government derives its just, limited, and revocable powers from the consent of the governed. It does not confer limited and revocable rights upon its subjects. If the central government can monopolize the legitimate use of force, it stands to reason that it can and will absorb and abolish all other liberties as well. Now, this has happened repeatedly in history, particularly in modern history. Invoking the desire for peace and safety, governments have disarmed their subjects only to visit them with sudden destruction of their lives and liberties. In many cases, visiting upon their hapless, abject populations the mass liquidation of those who are unsuitable for assimilation into the new order. In protecting the right of individuals to keep and bear arms, the framers of the Constitution drew upon and in some ways significantly expanded an ancient Anglo-Saxon concept of individual liberty. I want to review just a few examples of some of the thinkers throughout Anglo-Saxon history who have identified the intimate relationship between the right to keep and bear arms and limited government and individual freedom. Sir Walter Raleigh is an individual whose spurious trial for treason and whose unjust execution led to some significant reforms in Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence with respect to due process. One of the things that uh, Sir Walter Raleigh warned in his writings was that the first goal of any would-be tyrant is, quote, to unarm his people of weapons, money, and all means whereby they may resist his power. British essayists John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon wrote the immensely popular and very influential essays that were published as political tracts called Cato's Letters. They were made available in the 1720s. They were very popular in Britain and throughout the colonies. They had a great deal of influence on the thinking of our founding fathers. In, the, in Cato's Letters, Trenchard and Gordon warned, quote, he that is armed is always the master of the purse of him that is unarmed. And Cato's letters also had the following observation, which influenced the thinking of George Washington, among others, among our founding, uh, our founding fathers. Power is like fire. It warms, scorches, or destroys according as it is watched, provoked, or increased. And they understood that the right to keep and bear arms was in a very important check rein on the potentially destructive nature of government power. The exercise of despotic power, according to Trenchard and Gordon, is the unrelenting war of an armed tyrant upon his unarmed subjects. In the 1770s, as America was heading toward independence and the crisis between the crown and the colonies grew to a crescendo, English essayist James Burg declared, and I quote, No kingdom can be secured against tyranny otherwise than by arming the people. The possession of arms is the distinction between a freeman and a slave. Now, he was not the first British essayist of liberty to make that connection, to make that distinction, and to say that the possession of arms is what distinguishes a freeman from a slave. Scottish Whig essayist Andrew Fletcher, who wrote decades before James Burg, referred to arms in the hands of freemen as, and I quote, the only true badges of liberty, close quote. Fletcher was the author of an essay entitled A Discourse on Government with Relation to Militias, and that had a very obvious impact on the uh, American founders, particularly the framers of the Second Amendment. They used the term well-regulated militias to describe the people independent of central government authority. That's an expression that was to be found in Andrew Fletcher's writing on militias. The purpose of militias of that sort, meaning the body of the population with the right to keep and bear arms protected in law, the purpose of such militias was to keep the people, quote, free from the fears of invasion from abroad as well as from the danger of slavery at home. The possession of arms is the distinction between a freeman and a slave, continued Fletcher. He who has nothing and belongs to another must be defended by another and, must, and needs no arms but he who thinks he is his own master and has anything he may call his own ought to have arms to defend himself and what he possesses or else he lives precariously and at discretion. Now I think it's a very useful contrast 
that we can set up between Fletcher's explanation of how free people defend themselves and slaves depend upon others for their defense. To contrast that from Bill Clinton's endorsement of the idea that the American population is the property of the central government and must be protected by the central government. On February 28th of 1995, Bill Clinton said the following, quote, a crucial part of our job here in Washington is to help arm the American people through our police officers to fight crime and violence, close quote. In other words, we're not freemen, but slaves dependent upon the government for our defense. William Blackstone, the properly celebrated English jurist whose commentaries on the law were very influential in our founding and among the most widely read documents by our founding fathers, wrote that the right of the people of having arms for their own defense is a ne necessary function of, quote, the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression, close quote. Now it's important to recognize that Blackstone, like so many others among this pool of scholars, talked about the right to keep and bear arms as a necessary ingredient not only of armed defense against criminals in the private realm, but also against the oppression of government, criminals who act under the color of government authority. Now one critical way in which our founding fathers expanded upon this ancient Anglo-Saxon doctrine of liberty was by dispensing with the key limitation on the right to keep and bear arms. Many English theorists, Blackstone among them, referred to a right to bear arms as provided by law. The American founders, by way of contrast, specified that this right could not be infringed by law. That's a very important distinction, and that is, to the best of my knowledge, a uniquely American concept, that the right to keep and bear arms, like the right to speak freely, to express your opinions, to petition the government for grievances, these are God-given rights not subject to infringement by law. We could review very briefly how some of the American framers looked upon the right to keep and bear arms in the context of a free society and a free state. Alexander Hamilton, in Federalist Essay No. 29, addressed concerns about the emergence of a standing army in our country by assuring his readers, bear in mind this is a brief that Hamilton and Madison and Jay were writing on behalf of ratification of the Constitution. Hamilton assured his readers that such an army, quote, can never be formidable to the liberties of the people while there is a large body of citizens little if at all inferior to them in discipline and the use of arms who stand ready to defend their rights and those of their fellow citizens." Close quote. James Madison in the 46th Federalist Essay is properly remembered for explicitly referring to the well-regulated militia, meaning once again the people at large under arms, as the ultimate check upon a corrupted and tyrannical central government. Madison specifically referred in that Federalist Essay to Quote, the advantage of being armed which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, close quote. A lesser known but very important Federalist political advocate by the name of Tench Cox explained in his essay, An American Citizen, that if tyranny should emerge, quote, friends of liberty using those arms which providence has put into their hands will make a solemn appeal to the power above. And in a subsequent essay, Cox celebrated the fact that, quote, the powers of the sword are in the hands of the yeomanry of America from 16 to 60. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust God it will ever remain in the hands of the people, close quote. Now there is simply no academically respectable case to be made for the proposition that the right protected by the Second Amendment is a collective right to be exercised by the government in the interests of protecting us. One very useful admission against interest in this respect comes from left-wing academic Daniel Lazari, who is an outspoken advocate of overthrowing our constitutional order altogether and enacting a new constitution that's more statist in its outlook. In a 1999 Harper's Magazine essay, Daniel Lazari wrote the following, quote, The truth about the Second Amendment is something that liberals cannot bear to admit. The right wing is right. The amendment does confer an individual right to bear arms, and its very presence makes effective gun control in this country all but impossible, close quote. 
I would amend that statement only by saying that the Second Amendment does not confer anything. It simply protects a pre-existing right that is natural and innate in human beings as the result of being made in the image of our Creator. To continue from Daniel Lazari's essay, quote, It is now apparent that the amendment, the Second Amendment, despite its brevity, encapsulates an entire worldview concerning the nature of political power, the rights and duties of citizenship, and the relationship between the individual and the state. It is virtually a constitution within the constitution, which is undoubtedly why it fuels such fierce passions." Close quote. Once again, the worldview encapsulated in the Second Amendment, in which the Constitution elaborates at necessary length, is that the government does not have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. It cannot have monopoly on the legitimate use of force, being the creation of individuals who have delegated a portion of their God-given power to the Constitution to, pr to protect their God-given rights. Now, where the contrary proposition has prevailed, and government has been seen as an entity with a monopoly on the use of force, the result has been almost unfathomable bloodshed and horror. One of the best critiques of the idea that gun control or civilian disarmament brings peace and safety is to be found in a statement made in 1941 by Congressman Edwin Arthur Hall, who was opposing a proposition made at the time by the FDR administration that a national gun control, or forgive me, a national gun registration act be passed and implemented in our country. This is what Representative Hall had to say about that proposal. Quote, before the advent of Hitler or Stalin, who took power from the German and Russian peoples, measures were thrust upon the free legislatures of those countries to deprive the people of the possession and use of firearms, so that they could not resist the encroachments of such diabolical state police organizations as the Gestapo, the OGPU, and the Cheka, close quote. The OGPU and the Cheka were Soviet secret police organizations, and we'll talk about their contribution to the sorry history of civilian disarmament in a second. But one of the things that is largely misunderstood by the public, and very important that the public educate itself about, is the fact that gun control in the 20th century, once again, I would prefer to call it civilian disarmament in the 20th century, has been a necessary precondition for genocide. There's a very good group by the name of Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership that compiled this study, Lethal Laws, Gun Control is the Key to Genocide. What they have done is they have taken a study of all of the major episodes of genocide in the 20th century and shown how in each country where this has happened, a necessary precursor for this tragedy has been a civilian disarmament measure. Often that civilian disarmament measure was one that a totalitarian government inherited from a predecessor regime. Often these measures have been enacted by a totalitarian government in the interest of disarming its potential civilian opposition. Just a very brief review of how this process has worked in terms of the numbers. The Soviet Union, between 1929 and 1953, at least 20 million and probably as many as 30 or 40 million people were killed by the government largely as a result of the fact that they were disarmed by a government that had a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. In Nazi Germany and occupied Europe, between 1933 and 1945, we saw 13 million people killed. This excludes battlefield casualties. In China, from 1949 to 1976, another 20 million people, that is once again pretty much a bottom end estimate, were killed by a government that had enacted or that had built upon an existing gun control law. In Uganda, from 1971 to 1979, you had 300,000 people killed following a gun control or gun registration act. Cambodia, from 1975 to 1979, you had at least one million and perhaps as many as three million people who were killed in a nation where the totalitarian regime had enacted a gun control law. The most recent genocide studied by Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership was the 1994 genocide, as it's referred to the Otto Genocide in Rwanda. It began on the 7th of April of 1994 and ended on the 19th of July. Some 800,000 Rwandans were slaughtered by the regime in just 103 days. It's one of the most rapid and, and garish bloodlettings of which we have record. Not many people appreciate the fact that there were two types of registration 
that uh, were the precursors for the Rwandan genocide. The first was a uh, gun registration act that was passed in 1974 and was later firmed up into a gun control act in uh, 1979 that prevented civilians from buying firearms for their own defense. And the other was a national identity card registration act and that identity card contained the ethnicity of the person who held that card. That came in very handy when the regime decided that the Tutsi population must be massacred uh, out of a sense of ethnic grievance by the dominant Hutu regime. And that's why you had 800,000 Rwandans, many of them hacked to death with machetes, slaughtered by a government after they had been disarmed and left helpless. And the really interesting thing about that particular genocide is that the United Nations had a peacekeeping mission in Rwanda at the time that was informed of the fact that the genocide had been planned. And rather than acting several months before the genocide to preempt it, uh, the powers that be at UN headquarters in New York City decided that the United Nations peacekeepers should remain aloof from this matter. And as, as it happens, they presided over a mission that has become notorious now and is now cited as the supposed uh, proof of uh, the need for a more vigorous UN military enforcement arm. Uh, they did nothing to prevent the genocide. They did nothing to disarm the government as uh, the government prepared to kill hundreds of thousands of its disarmed subjects. And that once again is what happens when people trust in promises of peace and safety from those who would disarm them. Now the prototype for the process of genocide, I believe, and it could be it, that process could be summarized as follows. Disarmament, disenfranchisement, that is to say you're no longer allowed to participate in politics, dehumanization, and then destruction. The prototype for this process was, was the Soviet regime's purge and liquidation of its internal enemies. That began right after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. A Soviet decree issued on August 31st of 1918 said the following, quote, anyone caught in illegal possession of a firearm will be immediately executed. Gun collections and seizures commenced immediately in the Soviet secret police, which at the time was called the Cheka, dispatched spies that honeycombed every social institution in search of socially dangerous elements, or what are now called extremists in contemporary parlance. Those socially dangerous elements were those who resisted civilian disarmament. The Soviet regime conducted a particularly brutal disarmament campaign against the Cossacks of the Don River region and that illustrates, I think, how disarmament leads inevitably to tyranny and eventually to genocide. There's a very valuable study that came out in 1998 entitled The Black Book of Communism. In The Black Book of Communism, the author is drawing upon archival materials recently made available from the Soviet Union, uh, describe how the Cossacks were the subject of a campaign that eerily prefigures the Nazi campaign against the Jews. According to the Black Book of Communism, the Cossacks were ordered on pain of death to surrender all their arms. Historically, as the traditional frontier soldiers of the Russian Empire, all Cossacks had a right to bear arms, and all Cossack administrative assemblies were immediately dissolved. So you have dis disarmament and then disenfranchisement. Prior to the disarmament initiative, the Bolshevik government had planned to exterminate the Cossacks entirely. A secret Soviet resolution of January 24, 1919 decreed, quote, We must recognize as the only politically correct measure massive terror and a merciless fight against the rich Cossacks who must be exterminated and physically disposed of down to the last man, close quote. In predictable fashion, the Cossacks were rounded up by the secret police and herded into camps that foreshadowed once again in breathtaking and terrifying detail the extermination camps of Nazi-occupied Europe. Martin Latsis, who was the head of the Soviet secret police in Ukraine, described how Cossacks under his jurisdiction, quote, are dying like flies. General Tukhachevsky, who was commissioned by Lenin's regime to massacre anti-Soviet elements in Tambov province, set up death camps where prisoners were gassed. And once again, the Nazi parallels are quite interesting. And civilian disarmament was a precursor to the genocidal rampage conducted by Tukhachevsky. On June 11, 1921, General Tukhachevsky issued Order No. 171, which commanded troops under his authority, quote, to pronounce sentence on any village where arms are being hidden 
and to arrest hostages and shoot them if the whereabouts of the arms are not revealed. Wherever arms are found, execute immediately the eldest son in the family. And within days, Tukhachevsky and his berserkers commenced a gas warfare assault upon those few armed residents of the village who had sought refuge in a nearby forest. It is my belief that the National Socialist regime in Germany built upon the Soviet example, and I think that the parallels that we have mentioned thus far are really quite instructive. The difference here is that the Nazis made use of an existing gun registration law that had been passed during the era of the Weimar Republic, and lists of registered gun owners compiled by the predecessor, predecessor government made it quite easy for Hitler's totalitarian government to disarm its internal opposition, particularly Jews and others who were targeted for annihilation by that regime. There's an author and attorney, an attorney by the name of Dr. Stephen Halbrook, who is one of the leading scholars on the subject of civilian disarmament. And he has said that gun registration laws inherited by the Nazis, quote, made it easy for a tyrannical government to confiscate firearms and make prey of its subjects, close quote. Now, to illustrate how this works, Halbrook refers to the notorious purge and pogrom known in history as Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass. It was staged by the Nazis against the Jews of Germany in November of 1938. As Halbrook recounts the relevant developments, Kristallnacht, quote, was preceded by the confiscation of firearms from the Jewish victims. On November 8th of that year, the headline of a New York Times report from Berlin read, Berlin police head announces disarming of Jews. And the Times story reported as follows. After invading, Nazis used pre-war lists of gun owners to confiscate firearms and many gun, gun owners simply disappeared. Following confiscation, the Nazis were free to wreak their will upon the disarmed populace. Now it's interesting for me to see how the New York Times in 1938 had no difficulty seeing the connection between gun registration and the emergence of a lethal, murderous totalitarian regime. That's a connection that they don't particularly seem to recognize in the year 2000. Now, shortly before the actual rampage began, the Times reported, quote, that Berlin police president Count Wolf Heinrich von Heldorf announced that as a result of a police activity in the last few weeks, the entire Jewish population in Berlin had been disarmed with the confiscation of 2,569 hand weapons, 1,702 firearms, and 200,000 rounds of ammunition. Any Jews still found in possession of weapons without valid licenses are threatened with the severest punishment." Close quote. Now on the day following the Night of Broken Glass, the New York Times offered the following dispatch from Berlin. Quote, One of the first legal measures issued was an order by Heinrich Himmler, commander of all German police, forbidding Jews to possess any weapons whatever, and imposing a penalty of 20 years confinement in a concentration camp upon every Jew found in possession of a weapon hereafter." Close quote. Thousands of Jews were arrested and dispatched to concentration camps under the jurisdiction of Himmler, who would become the chief architect of the extermination project now known in history as the Holocaust. Now, contemporary advocates of civilian disarmament are either ignorant of this historical lesson or are content to exploit the ignorance of their audience. One such figure who has skillfully exploited the ignorance of his audience, of course, is Bill Clinton, who said the following on ABC's Good Morning America program on June 4, 1999, in response to a question about gun registration. Quote, should people ought to have to register guns like they register their cars? Do I think that? Of course I do. Of course I do. Close quote. Now, for the Nazis, gun registration lists were used to brand gun owners as potential enemies of the state. Many of these enemies of the state were subsequently branded with concentration camp tattoos and eventually fed to the crematoria. Now, where registration lists are unavailable, gun grabbers seek other means to entice gun owners to surrender their weapons, as General Gage did in Boston in 1775. Such measures include gun buybacks, which are a transparently dishonest euphemism because it assumes that the government can buy back something it did not previously own. Beginning in late 1999, the Clinton regime, acting through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, conducted a buyback initiative called Buyback America, through which police and housing authorities could collect firearms at a going rate of about $50 a copy. The interesting thing about the buyback initiative that HUD was conducting is that it obviously creates a black market for handguns and other weapons. Uh, 
all that's necessary is that somebody would steal a weapon and turn in the weapon to the police and get, a, get $50 from the police in exchange for as many guns as he can collect. Obviously, law-abiding citizens uh, have no, in, no incentive to turn in their weapons for $50. Obviously, criminals have no disincentive from going out and stealing those weapons so as to get $50 a copy for each one of them. The interesting thing about the Buy Back America program is that it was completely illegal. There was no money appropriated for Congre from Congress for the purposes of that initiative. And in June of 2000, Representative James Walsh, who oversees appropriations to HUD, informed the agency that the gun buyback program was an illegal expenditure and demanded that the department cease with the buyback program. And Bill Clinton, in the finest dictatorial tra tradition, simply dismissed this objection, saying that HUD has the authority to carry out this program because he willed it to be so. One of the reasons why it's important to take note of the so-called buyback initiative is that that is part of what's going on with the United Nations program for general and complete disarmament. General and complete disarmament is an expression that is familiar to people who have seen this document, Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in the Peaceful World. This was a proposal which was made in 1961 by John F. Kennedy as a framework for the creation of a United Nations monopoly on military force worldwide. In the third stage of this three-stage program, the United Nations would enjoy a monopoly on strategic weaponry, meaning nuclear arms, as well as a functional monopoly on the military forces of its member states. But each member state would be permitted to have an internal security force, which would be a centralized, militarized police body that would carry out policies compatible with the United Nations vision of international law. As part of each internal security forces monopoly on power within the constituent states of the United Nations, you would have to have some form of civilian disarmament to bring about general and complete disarmament except for those arms which are in the hands of authorities recognized by the UN. It's not well understood that the United Nations is conducting an effort at worldwide gun control and worldwide civilian disarmament. The UN Center for Disarmament Affairs which is deeply involved in this initiative, which began to gather steam back in 1995, refers to buybacks of weapons as a practical method of micro-disarmament. There's that expression again. Micro-disarmament is the disarmament of civilians. Macro-disarmament would be the disarmament of nations. And the UN Center for Disarmament Affairs refers to such examples of, of micro-disarmament as those conducted by UN peacekeeping forces in Haiti, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and other countries. A 1995 paper by Dr. Edward J. Lawrence, who is a consultant to the United Nations Register of Conventional Arms, studied both uh, buyback programs as practiced in many American cities and those conducted by the United States Army in Haiti. And in the latter example, once again, the United States Army was acting under UN authority. Dr. Lawrence says the government buybacks of small arms, quote, must be conducted in parallel with other efforts such as seizure programs. And the chief value of a gun buyback, according to Dr. Lawrence, is that a gun buyback program will focus attention on the links between weapons availability and crime. In other words, it's a way of persuading people that in the interest of peace and safety, the guns have to be under the monopoly control of the government. Sami Faltas of the Bonn International Center for Conversion, which is another think tank working with the United Nations, has made that point very explicitly. This is what Sami Faltas has to say about micro-disarmament. Quote, a subtle mix of rewards and penalties is needed for a weapons confiscation program to succeed. Ultimately, the ownership of arms should not be left to the personal choice of individuals. The state needs to preserve its monopoly of the legitimate use of force. So sanctions against the illegal possession and use of arms are necessary and should be imposed. However, during a weapons collection program, an amnesty is needed and the emphasis should be on voluntary compliance and positive incentives." Close quote. One other very useful scrap of documentation regarding the United Nations objectives in the area of civilian disarmament is a report that was issued in February of 1998 entitled Rapid Progress in UN's Worldwide Effort to Harmonize Gun Control Laws. It was put together by a United Nations Associated Researcher by the name of Philip Alpers from New Zealand. This is a, a summary of the four United Nations Economic and Social Council Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Regional Workshops 
on firearm regulation for the purposes of crime prevention and public safety. There's that word, safety, again, that were held in 1997 and 1998. This document quotes the United Nations as saying the following, quote, with the passing of the Cold War era and a shift from interstate military conflicts to insecurity resulting from violent crime, the United Nations has begun to turn its attention to a class of armament that is killing more people than major weapons, namely small, civilian-owned firearms. To control light weapons internationally, it will be necessary to control them nationally. Once again, we can see the link between the United Nations concept of civilian disarmament and the idea of general complete disarmament in the peaceful world. In order for weapons to be controlled internationally, you have to have national gun control. This document also talks about the four workshops that were conducted by the United Nations Economic and Social Council in which member nations were encouraged to regulate using such means as gun amnesties and or gun buybacks to regulate the possession of arms by civilians. The consensus achieved at these workshops, according to this document, contained the following assertions. Quote, it is not a right to possess a firearm. This was the consensus and there should be no free availability of firearms. To put the matter bluntly, the United Nations wants your guns. And it will use micro disarmament measures beginning with invitations, perhaps inducements such as the gun buyback method. It would include such measures as gun registration and ultimately will involve confiscation. And that's the process that's being discussed at the United Nations right now. Once again, it's useful to hark back to the hideous memory of Nazi-dominated Europe to see how micro-disarmament works in practice. Think of just the following examples. Following the invasion of Holland, occupation troops deployed posters that were published in both German and Flemish that had the following notice. All firearms and ammunition, hand grenades, explosive devices, and other war materiel are to be surrendered. The delivery must take place within 24 hours at the nearest German garrison. Following the capitulation of France, the same posters were deployed. These, of course, were written in both French and German. At the time that this was going on and the Nazis were rampaging through Europe, disarming populations and inflicting their version of peace and safety upon those occupied countries, the Swiss army issued a manual on armed resistance that to underscore the foolishness of surrendering your weapons to the type of government that would demand such unilateral disarmament of its subjects. Quote, should you be so trusting and turn over your weapons, you will be put on a blacklist in spite of everything. The enemy will always need hostages or forced laborers later on, that is, work slaves, and will gladly make use of the blacklists. After the deadline, raids coupled with house searches and street checks will be conducted. Close quote. And it's appropriate that those observations were made in a Swiss Army survival manual that talked about armed resistance because it will be remembered that Switzerland, which was a tiny landlocked nation surrounded by Axis-dominated nations, was the only nation in continental Europe that never made an arrangement, never made an accommodation with the Nazis. It remained free of the Nazis, it remained free of Axis domination, it remained unentangled from the hideous travesty and bloodshed that were World War II. In a large measure, that's because of the Swiss gun culture. It's not just a matter of geography, and it's not just a matter of having all the banks in Switzerland. Switzerland is a country in which every adult male is expected and required to have some proficiency in firearms. And everyone is expected to be part of their country's militia that will come to the aid of that country should it ever be invaded. On July 25th of 1940, as the totalitarians were working their will upon Europe, 600 officers of the Swiss Army gathered at Ritley Meadow on the shows, shores of Lake Lucerne. The Ridley Meadow is an area that is considered sacred in the history of the Swiss nation. I think it should be considered sacred in the history of free men and women everywhere. It was on August 1st of 1291 that the leaders of the three Swiss cantons gathered in Ridley Meadow to create the Swiss Confederacy for mutual defense. In July of 1940, the top leadership of the Swiss army had been gathered to Ridley Meadow by the commander-in-chief of the Swiss military, General Henri Guisson. They'd been brought there because the central government in Switzerland was making noises about a potential accommodation with the Nazis. 
and it looked as if Switzerland was going to go the way of so many other nations that had been basically bluffed into surrendering their liberty and their independence by the threat of Nazi aggression. So General Gieson drew the 600 top leaders of his military to Ritley Meadow. They knelt in prayer and then General Gieson gave one of the most stirring speeches of which we have record. He warned his gathered military leaders that uh, Switzerland was surrounded and its prospects were quite grim. Accordingly, he said, I decided to reunite you in this historic place, the symbolic ground of our independence, to explain the urgency of the situation. The survival of Switzerland is at stake. Currently there are, beyond our borders, more troops and excellent troops than ever before. We can be attacked on all fronts at the same time, which was not really conceivable a few weeks ago. General Gieson had set the stage for this meeting by issuing the following directive to his military command. If by radio, leaflets, or other media any information is transmitted, doubting the will of the Federal Council or of the Army High Command to resist an attacker, this information must be regarded as lies of enemy propaganda. Our country will resist aggression with all means in its power and to the bitter end. Everywhere, General Gieson told those who were gathered at Ridley Meadow, the order is to hold it is the duty of conscience of each fighter, even if he depends on himself alone, to fight at his assigned position. The riflemen, if overtaken or surrounded, must fight in their position until no more ammunition exists. Then cold steel is next. Here, soldiers of 1940, we will inspire ourselves with the lesson and spirit of the past to envisage the resolution of the present and future of the country. To hear the mysterious call that pervades this meadow, to defeat his propaganda, everyone should oppose the spirit which animated the mountain folk, who in 1291, when left to themselves, placed their confidence in themselves and in God. Thus will the country be strong and the army quite ready. One order is ample, hold fast. Now, in World War I, General Kaiser Wilhelm made a brief stop in Switzerland as he was sizing up the prospects for a potential move by Germany against the Swiss. As he was speaking with the Swiss militiamen and inspecting border fortifications, the Kaiser said to the Swiss militiamen, what will you 250,000 Swiss militiamen do if tomorrow 500,000 Germans come streaming over your border? The Swiss militiamen fixed the Kaiser with the steely-eyed stare and said, each of us will shoot twice and go home. So that's the answer of a free man from a free society that understands the role of firearms the right to keep and bear arms in a free society. And in the spirit of Rutley Meadow, in the spirit of Lexington and Concord and Independence Hall, it is necessary for Americans to protect the right that protects all others. And in order to do so, it is necessary that we understand the rule of law and the concepts embodied in our Constitution. We have to understand how in our society, government does not have monopoly on the legitimate use of force. But just as important as that understanding is the understanding that it is not enough to be armed, to know how to use weapons and defensive rights that you do not adequately understand. And it does little good to understand the nature of your rights if you don't understand the nature of law as a protector of those rights, a law that will govern both the government and the governed. Americans are citizens who should be governed. We must never be subjects who are ruled. And in order to prevent America from sliding into the abysm of tyranny that has devoured so many other nations in history, to protect our independence against the encroachments of a UN-dominated New World Order, it is necessary that people organize and take effective, concerted action based on sound principle. And that is the purpose of the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society is the largest group of men and women who understand the Constitution and are prepared to defend the Constitution that we will find anywhere in our country. Just as importantly, we are the only organization that understands the true implications of the United Nations and its agenda for general and complete disarmament. Peace and safety on totalitarian terms is what the United Nations represents. If you prefer liberty to totalitarian peace and safety, then I would hardly suggest that you join with the John Birch Society in this epic undertaking.